Testing, testing. I believe everything's working. So I wanted to say hi, everyone, and welcome to the channel. I uh, was thinking about what to discuss on this live stream this week, and of course, my three topics that came to mind were going to be getting injured. Uh, I want to talk about filter socks because I had a lot of people ask me about filter socks, and you know, for some reason, this is the week. <laughs> and then emergency or backup pumps for when your main pump fails. So those are our topics for today. Let me open up my Google Docs for real quick in case I'm getting help from my moderators. Hi, guys. <laughs> Will says, don't worry, I'm here. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad we're covered. Let's see. All right, today is the July 6th. We are ready. Hey, Eric. All righty. So now that I've got that on my screen, I almost wish my little dock was more like a little tiny chat window so it would fit my screen better. But it is what it is. Cindy, welcome to the live stream for making it on time. So today, uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to start the stream early. <laughs> I was thinking something crazy like 1.30 instead of 2 o'clock. And I thought that's kind of rude because number one, you didn't know. And then, believe it or not, I still didn't get started at 2 o'clock, <laughs> even with me setting everything up. So today I've got another different setup. Every week I seem to change it, how I set this up, uh, the way it's sitting. I have a huge table here, and it allows me to set the monitor safely since that computer cost a lot of money, as you guys saw a few months ago. I noticed a lot of you guys watched the new Sump video, and I uh, got a lot of great feedback on that edit. And I want to thank you guys because... I'm learning new editing software, and it's hard. And it, there's nothing intuitive about it. And I had to call a buddy a couple of times to ask, how do you do this? How do you do that? And he gave me some more advice. But no, so it works great. All right, so let's get to the point. Today I got in, or this week. This week I got injured. I was working on building a bunch of RODI systems for my customers. And I have a huge metal bracket that the main unit sits on. And when, the, uh, when I was done and I was putting everything away, I was just moving the bracket across the table. And on the table, I have a razor blade with a small magnet. And I use that to trim off the edge of paper or plastic off of acrylic. I've been using that thing for 15 years. And I've got poked a few times over the years, but nothing like what happened that night. I think it was Monday night. And what happened was as I moved the big steel bracket, the magnet just shoot right to it. And the blade just sliced straight through my thumb. And it was bad and blood came out so fast. <laughs> So I just held my thumb together and I just watched it welling up between my fingers, you know, of my other hand. And I'm running to the sink and I put underwater and I'm washing it. And it's like, it's not just flowing, it's pulsing out. I'm like, that's not good. So I held it shut and I waited a couple minutes and I tried to put a towel on there. And of course the towel got, you know, paper towel. It instantly got really bloody. And then I had another one and another one. I was like, okay, none of this is gonna work. I need to get to my bathroom because that's where my first aid supplies are. And so I transferred over there and I did rubbing alcohol on the wound and I, I was studying it and I was like, you know, I think this is an ER visit. I don't think I'm gonna be able to uh, just bandage this up and call it a day. And I know some of my friends are like, just glue it, you'll be fine, keep going. But it was bad. And so then I had to figure out how do I drive to the hospital with a damaged thumb because I'm kind of holding it together. You know, I've got my hand like this around it, trying to hold the thumb together because it was on the side of the thumb and you, and that was the only way to keep the skin together and kind of, and I had a towel in there, I was like squished. Made it to the hospital, showed up at ER, you know, it's like one in the morning and I said, I don't even know if I need to be here. Someone can just look at this and say, go home or stay. That would be awesome. And you know, within 20 minutes or so, I saw a doctor and she's like, no, I'm really glad you came in. You sliced the, she called it the vein artery. And I was like, that's not a thing. <laughs> there's veins and there's arteries. She goes, they're side by side and you slice through both. I was like, oh. So she uh, cleaned out the wound and she was very happy. I sliced it with a razor blade because she said, it's so nice and the edges are, the margins are so smooth. They just glue right back together, you know, glue. I mean, stitch back together. And she slowly sewed me up and she actually had to stitch the artery shut so no more blood could come out. So I got a little nervous because I thought, well, doesn't, do I need that blood to go into my thumb, you know? But she knows better. My thumb didn't change color, so that's a good sign. And maybe after a while, they reopen it and it just goes back out. I don't know. But um, 
it's not gross or anything. If you guys want to see the stitches, uh, tell me. If you don't, that's fine too. Uh, it's had all week to heal. I've, I've basically taken it really easy uh, because I did not want to bump it. I definitely couldn't get it wet. Didn't want it near my aquarium. Didn't want it near solvents for gluing. I just kind of used the holiday week as a way to kind of like just let my body heal. And that's what I did. <clears throat> but the yes, it, Derry says, don't get blood in the tundra. No, I really, I was, I was happy. I didn't get blood on the carpet. Um, yeah, I really seemed to only get it in the sink or in the hospital. You know, I didn't you know, get it everywhere. I still have the blade here. Some of my DNA is still on it. <laughs> Damn thing. Uh, yeah, so that thing really got me. And it's funny because about a year ago, I, I stabbed this thumb with a utility knife, but that one was completely my fault. This one, there was, I didn't see it coming, but uh, I was working on my table and I was cutting something from, there was some acrylic involved, and I was cutting some paper and I was pulling the piece toward me. And when I pulled it toward me, I had already put the blade down. I was done with it. I got it out of my hands and I pulled the piece of acrylic toward me and my hand just kind of pulled back really fast and went straight into the blade of the knife just sitting on the table. That one bled a lot too. I probably nicked the same vein artery as well. But in the end, I just ended up with a, you know, really wet bandages for 24 hours. But this time I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do the ER. And it's probably gonna cost me a thousand dollars for this stupid accident, you know, in, you know, after all is said and done with the insurance. But in the meantime, while I was injured this week, I was able to get about 15 orders out still. So it's not like everything came to a crashing halt, but I know there's, you know, a dozen of you are like, where's my this, where's my that? And a lot of it's been cut out <clears throat> and I just need to start gluing it together. And now that my thumb is more trustworthy, I feel like I can start doing it. But this is my dominant hand that I sliced. And so once that happened, I was just like, hmm, better not uh, push it. So that was, <laughs> James says I should frame the blade. <laughs> That's hilarious. Eric wants to see it. All right, he's the only one. No one else wanted to see it. So here is my blue stitches. So it doesn't look that bad, but it was on the side of the thumb. And so um, there's a lot of nerves there. There's a lot of, uh, well, apparently there's blood flow there. And she had to inject it with uh, some kind of a numbing agent four times, because once wasn't enough. And then when she was sewing it together, she would poke it to see if more blood would come out, which of course it did. <laughs> She'd sew another stitch and poke it. And I'm just watching this thinking, wow. So anyway. That was a dumb accident. Uh, my son came up with a brilliant solution ever since. Um, he told me, Dad, I've seen that thing on your table, you know, every time I come there. I said, yeah, I know, it's always been there. And he said, well, I think you should take the magnet off the blade when you're not using it. And I was like, that is the most brilliant advice I've gotten from my kid out of a long time. <laughs> so that's what I've done. I've separated them. So now if I were to do something, the magnet jumps over and grabs onto something like the side of a drill, side of a tape, uh, packaging tape dispenser, uh, any other metal object I have on my table, it won't be bearing a blade at the same time, which that's, I don't know why I never thought of that, but sometimes your kids teach you lessons, right? So yeah, it wasn't that bad, but it was bad enough. And to be honest, I'm still kind of like constantly, you know, I'm trying to leave it alone. Um, I didn't lose a thumb. I, you know, I didn't have something happen on the CNC machine. It literally was just me having an accident, uh, cleaning up, putting things away. <laughs> What a way to get hurt when you're not working, right? So anyway, um, let's switch gears because uh, I told you guys, you know, multiple topics. The second topic I wanted to talk about was filter socks. And I think we're just going to talk about socks in general today because that one is a pretty common uh, filtration item that a lot of people like to use. And I always see questions about it. You know, well, how often do you have to change them? Um, what micron level do you need? Um, you know, it just seems like there's a, and then of course, you know, where do you buy them? <laughs> How do I make it fit? Why won't this fit? Can I use a filter cup instead? So there's all these options. So here is a very common filter sock. This is a 200 micron sock, which means anything under 200 micron is going to be caught in here. And you would just mount this inside a holder and it would sit inside your sump and the water drains in. If you don't have that kind of a situation, you can definitely rig something if you wanted to use a sock. I don't like socks myself because you have to keep cleaning them and I don't like that constant duty. <laughs> That's just too much work. So I'm not a, a fan of socks. 
Now, I guess the biggest question is why would you want a sock in the first place? A lot of people use socks specifically to trap the, to trap the bubbles from making it through the sump and back into the return pump. So if everything's bubbling in the sock and only water's coming out, you've killed your bubble problem. So eh, I can see why people do that. But the thing is, as these socks get dirty, they just fill up with a brown gunk and it, it just fills up and fills up and fills up until it gets up to here. And then finally it just overflows. And some people wait to change the sock when this is overflowing and that is the wrong way to use a sock. The sock's job is to catch the particulates and polish your water and make it pretty. And you're supposed to do that over a matter of a couple of days. And I tell, I tell people three days. So every three days change your socks. So if your sump has two socks in it, you've got to do two socks every three days. You're looking at uh, 20 socks a month. You've got to keep cleaning. So I would not enjoy that job myself, but some people will take a, like a diaper pail and they'll take all the dirty ones and throw them in the diaper pail all month long. And then they wash them all at once. And we'll get into that in a second. Now that's a 200 micron. There's other people that can't stand washing their socks either. And so they get something called a mesh sock. And this one here also is 200 microns, also from Blue Life. And you know, it's semi-see-through and it doesn't clog up as quickly. So it'll still catch stuff, but it's easier to rinse clean. You can invert it really easily to clean it out and make yourself you know, a nice clean sock again. So there's that. And then if you have a bigger system like I do, you might need a seven inch sock and I'm talking about the diameter of the plastic ring. And this one here is a 10 micron sock. This is the kind of sock I would recommend that you use when you're using Phosphate RX. And uh, this one has a couple of like handles in here which would give you the ability to pull it out. But I usually cut them off so I can put the pipe in there you know, when I'm draining down and also so I can uh, invert the sock to clean it out. It's harder to do with these things in the way. So you just cut them out with scissors or a utility knife and don't cut your thumb. Now, how do you clean a filter sock? Bleach water is an easy approach. Um, vinegar is gonna be slower and kinda, I don't really see the point. Uh, the simplest solution, and it was a trick someone taught me oh, years ago, he said, take your filter sock and take a broom handle and push the sock down on the handle to invert the sock. So, you know, you just have to, you know, your sock's gonna be a little bit cruddy. You're gonna turn it inside out like, you know, so it's like that push it down on the handle and push the ring straight down and the sock will come out the other side and you can really blast it with a garden hose. You can use a pressure washer, you can use a garden hose. Those are some, I see a lot of public aquariums, they just pull the socks out and they throw them on a certain spot on the ground and they hit it with a garden hose because it all flows into a floor drain and then their socks are, you know, less dirty. I mean, they, they don't look white, they don't look brand new again. Now, if you use bleach water, you'll definitely get them white again. And you can do that. And then once you're done, you definitely want to rinse them really well. And then you want to air dry them outside for 24 hours. And the reason for that is because the sunlight helps evaporate the chlorine that came from the bleach. So after they've been airing out for 24 hours, you can smell them and they should smell bleach free. If you're still nervous and you don't trust it, or you don't, you know, you just have a bad feeling, then you can go ahead and soak those cleaned, dried socks back in solution. You can just fill it up with water and use some prime which is the product from Seachem that locks up ammonia and chlorine and chloramine, nitrite, nitrate. <laughs> so whatever's in that bottle, it, it locks up everything. And so now your socks will be completely clean. So basically you did like this quick shake off bath inside Prime. And now you know you can totally use your sock. Uh, one of the things that some people run into with a brand new sock that they never used before when they install it is that it makes their protein skimmer go a little bit crazy. Um, it could be the material itself. Odds are it's a chemical on the material. Don't know why there'd be one on there, but there is. And so in your case, you may want to pre-rinse it before you put it in the sock to help avoid your skimmer going nuts. Um, oh, so people have also tried to figure out other ways to wash socks besides what I'm saying with a pressure washer or garden hose. Uh, not all of us have a pressure washer. I don't even have one. I have to go to the car wash, but I do a lot with a garden hose. But if you wanted something else, another option is, this, is the washing machine where you do your laundry. But uh, you're gonna need spousal approval for that one because if you don't, you'll get yourself in trouble. <laughs> now, I had an old style washing machine where you lift the lid and it had those uh, three or four blades on in the inside. And as it would spin, it would kind of like, I mean, you know, agitate to clean this, the laundry. I had all my socks in there. And when I opened the washing machine when it was done, three of the four blades are broken off. And of course the socks are totally fine. 
So it cost me 100 bucks to fix my washing machine. Now, I have a new washing machine. That's the one where you load from the front and it's just basically a drum. And I can put socks in there all day long and it won't affect it whatsoever. So if you were wanting to wash your socks in the washing machine, you can. Obviously, you're not going to use soap. There is a chance that there is soap from the last load in there. So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, you can put it through a, a, you know, a wash and pour vinegar in where you'd put in the soap and then uh, do a double rinse cycle. You know, again, back to drying it out and making sure it's been aired out for a while. Smell the fabric, make sure it's okay. But if you do all that, you should be okay with reusing socks over and over. And if you're wealthy, you just throw the sock away and get a new one every single time. And uh, that, that's uh, crazy to me, but some people do it. So that is your, uh, you're free to do that if you like. Hey, Wade asked me if I could sell the removable sock box for a full length sock. Yeah, I probably can. Uh, just get with me on my website and we'll uh, figure out the exact dimensions that make you happy and come up with something that would work. So I want to talk about that. That was part of this topic. So I think I covered everything on socks. If I forgot anything, just ask questions. Eric will get them into my, my list of things to cover. But this was really cool. So last weekend, no, last Tuesday, my auto feeder decided to drop the entire drum of food into my tank all at once. I mentioned this on Instagram, but if you didn't see it, I thought I'd cover it today on the live stream. So I had just filled it up because it was empty. And I just filled it up. I got stitches on my thumb. I got a big splint on it and a big bandage wrapped around my hand, you know, keep it dry. And I got some food into it and put it on top of the tank and hit the button once. So that way a little food to go in there and make Spock happy and all the fish could start snacking. And then my friend said, Mark, I'm taking you out to lunch. And when we came back, my tank had flakes everywhere. And I was looking at it thinking I had a precipitation event. I thought, what is going on in my water? That's so weird. Everything's within margins, you know, where it should be. And while looking at it, I discovered that my auto feeder was still turning and turning and turning and the drum was completely empty. It had just dumped in like three weeks of food in one hour into my tank. So I used the sock box, which was awesome. And what really impressed me, I mean, the sock box, that was his intention. That's exactly why I got it for something like deep cleaning. I put the sock in there. I changed the gate valves so that the water would drain only into the sock box through the emergency drains. And it was very loud. And you could just see the water gushing in there and the sock was just filling up with, with all the, you know, the waste. And it was great. But what I did not expect, I didn't even think it was even possible. After a while, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to slow the flow a little bit by opening the valve that goes to the skimmer zone. Um, that's the gate valve, the big gate valve that you saw in the video. And so I turned it slightly and what I ended up, and, I, and I'm looking at the emergency drains and the water's just pouring out, but it's not noisy anymore. I'm not hearing the swallowing, gurgling sound from the overflow box. It's just pouring down the pipe quietly, going into the sock. And I discovered that I could actually run a sock box with emergency drains in a quiet mode and not have, um, that chugging sound. And that just blew me away. And I called Dwayne and said, Dwayne, you won't believe what just happened. And he, I told him what happened. He goes, I can't believe that worked. <laughs> and neither could I. So, I mean, not only did I, you know, when I built the new sump, come up with something that I thought would be really practical, it ended up being awesome too. And I didn't expect that. It was like a really cool plus. So I was really happy with that. So if you guys don't have gate valves on your drains and you can get to that point, it would really benefit you. Um, I, I'm just blown away. I'm standing in front of my tank right now and you know, there's some noise down here behind me, but it's minimal compared to the way it was in the old days when I had all the Durso drains that I trusted and used for, I don't know, since 2002. So I would, I'm, I'm really impressed with it. So Herbie, Google the Herbie drain system and see if you can apply it. Uh, the rule is one drain is full siphon, one drain is, uh, uh, well, see both of mine are on gate valves. Um, at the very least, one drain is full siphon and one is emergency. So you'd have to have two pipes going down. And if your tank only has two bulkheads, you basically would have to use both of those for your drain system and then start a return line that comes up over the top and into the tank itself. And that way you are uh, finding another way to get water in the tank because you stole the two pipes in the overflow box. But, and I think a quiet tank with one extra pipe coming up over the top and over the back you know, who cares if it's coming up from behind and how it enters the tank, especially if you have a cover on the top, no one can see it. So all it is is some PVC fittings and, uh, you know, some elbows and some PVC pipe. Super easy to do. 
Very, very impressed. I'm going to be changing out the uh, entire sump system on the frag tank for a better one. And when I do that, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to add a third drain to that tank so I can run the Herbie on there as well. And between those two things, it'll be very, very quiet. All right. Um, have you started using the Clarity yet? Not yet. I um, That's coming. But uh, for now, getting, being able to use that sock box temporarily was amazing. And right now it's off. You know, the, oh, one more thing I want to talk about. Uh, when it comes to socks, you set up your sock in your tank. You're feeding your fish. The water goes down the drain. Fish food goes in here. Fish waste goes in here. And it stays here every single minute of every single day until you remove the sock. So if you are not changing this out frequently, you're leaving all the rotting stuff in here to continually rot and add to your water quality problems. So keep that in mind uh, because that's one of the reasons why I say get it out within three days. The longer it sits in there, the less beneficial it is to your tank. And then of course, once it's overflowing, it's got zero benefit at all. It's just a, a little volcano in your sump creating salt spatter and salt creep and possibly noise. Uh, there's only one other benefit to having a sock in your sump that I can, you know, I easily identify, and that's just keeping the sump clean, which is nice, but it's just not critical. It's the sump. But if you don't like any detritus in the bottom, if you don't want to have to pump it out or shot vac it out, and you just like to see clean equipment inside a, an acrylic box, then using socks is the way to keep the sump clean, but you made yourself an extra job for the, the rest of your aquarium life. So, all right. That was that one. Um, Pickle Boy is asking, what can I use to clean out a protein skimmer? Uh, well, one of the easiest methods to clean a skimmer is to go ahead and stick it inside a bucket or a trash can with water and vinegar and turn it on and just let it run. And then after it's been running overnight, the next day, take it all apart, clean everything, reassemble it and reinstall it on your tank. Elmer asked me if I could say hoy, and he says that is Dutch for high. <laughs> uh, would water temperatures being at 83 be enough to cause an acropora to bleach? It shouldn't. Uh, 83 is not that hot. If uh, the water normally is 76 and your tank shot up to 83, eh, it could be enough to annoy a few corals, maybe you know, affect them a little bit, but usually it has to be over 85 or even hotter. And once you hit 85, the oxygen level in your tank drops too, which affects your fish. So cooling fans are a really great way to keep your water temperature in a, um, uh, in a preferable range without a lot of expense. Uh, any problems with the calcium reactor media in my refugium? No. No, actually, it has worked out really well. I mean, what's, what can happen? It's been a week. <laughs> I just have it down there in the bottom. The idea is that if, if and when I want to clean that section out, I can just scooch all the media over. And I can then use like the VCA uh, gravel vac attachment on a maxi jet and just pump out all the detritus and then move the gravel the other way and pump out that detritus and just get it out of the system. So, you know, I, I, a lot of people thought I was using for buffer or something like that. And I just was doing something instead of sand just to see what it's like because a couple of people had recommended it to me. Oh, on the vinegar to water ratio, 50-50. Uh, if you can make the skimmer fit in a bucket, then you're not going to need a lot of you, a gallon of vinegar, a gallon of water. That'll probably get you this much water. And you can put the skimmer in there, just turn it on, and let it just overflow inside there. All right. Um, so my third topic for today is an important one. And it's one that I needed to apply myself because I give you this advice, and then I'm not listening to myself. And I mean, I am, but anyway. As you guys know, the return pump on my reef is the abyss. And that is a pump that has uh, got a 10-year warranty. And so in other words, you know, I should be good to go for 10 years. But as we know, anything mechanical can and will at some point fail. And when that's the case, what are you going to do? And if my abyss were to shut off today, what is my solution immediately besides Vortex or running on the tank? I mean, how am I going to get water down to the sump? How am I going to get water back up out of the sump? That's a problem. And so do I have to grab an L1 off the shelf? and hook that up really quick, which is totally different plumbing parts. Um, what is my option? And so what I ended up doing this week, a friend of mine had contacted me needing help with a, a basement install. And we were doing some research and we found a really good uh, new pump that came to market that will work in his uh, scenario. 
and I went ahead and I was looking at it. I was like, you know what? I need a backup return pump. So I ordered me one. So let me see if I can switch this. I didn't even look at this other camera angle yet. Uh, yeah, that'll work. All right, so I got this big box. See? And inside here is a brand new pump that was made or branded or sold by MRC, which is my Reef Creations, the same people that um, did the skimmer and the sump for my client. And they are selling these pumps now. So I ordered the LP4200. It's a big pump with a two inch intake and a one and a half inch output. And um, it is literally my backup pump. That is the only reason I bought it. So I can't do a review about it or you know any kind of follow up because I'm not gonna turn it on, get it wet, just to try it out for a minute and then just put it on a shelf and let it just sit there corroding because unfortunately when salt water gets into a pump no matter how much you rinse it there's still some salt in the seals and then eventually when you're finally ready to put the pump in you hook it up it tends to leak and that's been my experience in the past so i went ahead and i ordered this pump and it's just here so i have it for if and when i ever need it I don't know what I did with my trusty lethal razor blade, my blood soaked razor blade. So I'm going to unwrap this for you guys and then I'm going to wrap it again when I'm done so it stays safe. See, it just cuts like a knife. So this pump, um, I don't know all the specs by heart, so I'm going to have to refer to the manual here. Oh, so made in America, five year warranty. That's pretty good, right? Slide this over a little bit more. And it's pretty heavy. Uh, I'll have to make sure that the cord is long enough for it's going to be installed. This is the business end. And uh, I don't even know how much power it's going to pull. <laughs> but I do know if I need power, I'm going to need it. Now, I do know it plugs into 110 volt, which is fine. Um, I can't remember the specs. I think it's somewhere around 3,000 gallons an hour or so from this. So very nice pump um, from a very well-known company that's got a great uh, reputation for high quality. And so I was when I found out they were selling them, I was like, yeah, I definitely need this pump. And so I went ahead and I ordered one. So I found a way to spend some money this week. <laughs> but that's, that's important. You know, you want to have something like that. And they have this one and they have a larger one. And the, my buddy got the larger one because he's pushing um, from a basement to the next floor up to two aquariums. And he's doing it with uh, something like, I think we measured like 33 horizontal feet because it had to go up and way across and through a crawl space and then up through the floor. Big ordeal. And so he got the larger one that would handle a lot of flow. And that way he'd have plenty of water moving back up because right now he's limping along with an M1 pump and it's, it's, it's struggling because it's rigged. It's, it's not the way it was designed. And it turns out the original plumbing couldn't handle the head pressure and it just wouldn't get any water in the tank. So I want to really recommend to you guys that you have some kind of a pump on hand when you're, uh, when you're needing one and don't sit there and don't buy it until you absolutely need it. Because typically you'll pay more in an emergency situation. You'll be saying ship it overnight. They're like, it's really heavy. You're like $200 shipping. <laughs> so you definitely want to do that. You want to get this now, put it on the shelf, have it ready, you know, whatever pump you're going to use, and just have it. So that way, when you're in a pinch, you can swap it out. If for uh, example, you know, I, here I chose something completely different. Instead of buying a second Abyss pump, you know, Abyss pumps are close to $2,000 a piece. So having another one on the shelf is a huge investment. This one retailed about $500. I think that's right. $500, $550, something like that. Um, and 
so you know I'm set, I'm protected, and that's what matters with our reef tanks. You know, if you whatever return pump you have now, if you can get a second one of the same thing and just have it ready, all your plumbing will go together really easy. And if you don't have an extra one, you're making a mistake. Now you can use the extra one for useful things like mixing salt water and pumping salt water for water changes. But then if you ever have a failure, you can grab your salt water pump and use it as your return pump and keep your tank happy because you're not going to be mixing and moving salt water when a pump fails. You're just trying to get the, the reef to run. So I wanted to emphasize the importance of having a backup return pump in today's live stream. All right. Um, Discus asked me, <laughs> Uncle Milev, what do you use for phosphate? My phosphate is constant at 0.2 and I can't seem to get it down. Where's my phone? I want to show you guys something. So last year I tested all my water. I was a day early, but at least I got it done, right? Okay. So I tested my phosphates last night and I don't know what color this is, but let's see if I can do it like that. It seems to be close to the 0.5 mark. So 0.2, not a lot to worry about. It's a little bit up, but um, it's not enough to be worried. 0 0.2, 0 0.25, that's not a scary number. Now, what I've always used to remove phosphate is Phosphate RX. But since I've been dosing my tank um, with Nopox since, I just looked this up yesterday, but I forgot already today. I'm gonna check in my Reef Trace app because that's where I keep all my notes. Um, I started dosing no pox on 328, 428, 528, 628, so 12. I'm probably my 13th week of dosing no pox. And because of that, it has been keeping my uh, phosphates down. Uh, it was staying down around 0.1. And so for it to be up this week surprised me. But then again, I just dropped a three week supply of food into my tank and it probably got under the water column. So maybe I'll have to rely on no pox to remove it and, you know, not sweat it, or maybe I'll add some phosphate RX. I don't really like combining different chemicals um, at, during the same treatment. You know, like I do one thing and then I do the next one. Uh, Mike says, isn't it uh, a chore to vacuum out detritus out of the sump? I, I prefer the ease of throwing socks in the washer. It's whatever works best for you. For me to clean out the detritus on my sump every few months doesn't bother me at all. You know, it has to build up to a decent amount. I'm like, okay, today I'll do it. But usually I just see a little bit here and a little bit there. And like right now I have a brand new sump and there's a little bit of stuff down there that I'm going to do or remove once my thumb is able to go in salt water again. But for now, it's going to hold off. Uh, Ariel says, what do you do when your corals break off? Do you frag them and sell them? Almost never. Uh, they typically break off and then I put them somewhere else because uh, I like to fill the tank up. And I had a coral down here that somebody knocked off that went down there. And it's sitting, well, sitting on top of this one last night. And by morning, it had scooched over a half an inch. So I have to get my arm all the way down the tank. I have to use my left arm and put a, drop, uh, a blob of glue on the bottom and try and glue it back into place. But I don't do a lot of uh, fragging in the first place. And I, I really don't do a lot of selling because uh, I just can't stand it. <laughs> Speaking of selling... I'll throw this up on the screen for you guys. It's a subliminal message. Uh, anything you buy from my website helps me keep doing this and allows me to provide you with quality materials that you can use in your own aquarium and have a pretty tank too. So I always appreciate it when I get up and I check the computer and it shows a few orders came in. That is awesome. And I love your support. So thank you so much for that. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, Nick asks, I'm about to pick up a female mandarin for my male, and I have a little bit of cyano, and I want to use cyano RX. Should I wait until the uh, new fish is settled in, or will it be okay? Your fish should not be affected whatsoever by red cyano RX. Uh, the only thing that can affect fish is a low oxygen level. So that's why products like ChemiClean and red cyano RX recommend you put an air stone in the tank to add extra air. And I know a lot of people say, well, just leave your skimmer on with the cup off. I don't recommend that. Uh, it's too much mess. So just add an air stone. It's really easy. An air pump and an air stone, just let it bubble in the tank. Put it in front of a power head if you want, so it blows the bubbles everywhere. And that'll raise the oxygen level in the tank, and your fish should be fine. Uh, Sam says, Mark, would you not consider running two pumps? Reduce the power on both, and then you always have a fail-safe. That's how I ran my reef for many years, but I didn't run them the way you're thinking. I ran one for my return pump, and I ran the second one for my man manifold, 
and it fed multiple items. And, the, and I built a valve in the middle. And that way, if and when I had a problem with one pump, I could close one valve, open another valve, and the other pump would take over. And I tested it, and it worked great. <laughs> but I'm laughing because I had a pump fail at one point, and I was like, ah, oh, it failed. And so I had to, get, you know, put down towels, and I had to, you know, drain the plumbing, and I had to remove the old pump that I was replacing. And I spent hours down there. It wasn't like a quick five-minute swap out. It was just, I don't know, it was involved. And then I was done probably two hours later. And as I was tightening the union on the top of the pump, I looked right above the union. And there was that valve that I'd installed in 2011. And I was like, are you kidding me? I could have had the tank running the entire time while I was working on this one pump because it was isolated by closed valves. And I totally forgot I had that option, even though I built it in many years ago. So... You know, it's great to plan ahead, but it's even better if you use the things you planned ahead with. <laughs> so in my case, uh, no, I've always felt that one pump was good. And the uh, if there's a problem and I have to replace one, I have one on hand. And that's what I did this time. I, I kind of was living life loose, not having a backup return pump. Even though there's always an option, but having one sitting here right now, holiday weekend, all the stores are closed. Doesn't matter if it's the middle of the night, I can just get on it and solve it. Uh, Kev asks a bubble tip anemone question. I have two that are struggling, yet the rest are fine. Um, they're going brown. They're starting to have gaping mouths, but the parameters check out. Uh, could it be that those two that are not happy uh, were in a situation where they're, they just split recently and they're just not happy? Um, for them to... For two to act up when the rest are fine, it kind of makes me think more like they're not bubble tips. Like they're another species that you thought was a bubble tip, but like, for example, was a sea bay. And I'm only asking that because that's what happened to me. The big anemone behind me is a sea bay, and I put it in my anemone cube, and it shriveled up and got miserable and pale. And I moved it out into the main tank where it was not in the same body of water as the anemones. And it not only healed up, it became a massive, beautiful showpiece. But uh, check your water temperature, make sure that it's stable. Uh, keep an eye on those guys. I don't try to force feed anemones. I barely feed them at all, but you know, if you're going to, the food should be the size of a lima bean. You don't need to see an anemone poop into your tank. You can just put it in and it'll eat and the food vanishes. That's, that's how I like my animals to eat. Uh, I don't wanna see a big blob blowing around at the bottom of the tank you know, that the, the animal could not consider out the extra because of so much. Uh, reef and dive, yes. Could Mark said, uh, he said, Mark, could a small pump like we use for mixing salt be used to partially solve a problem for a few hours or days? Yeah, absolutely. If you can rig it, then do it. And so, you know, it's just like, you know, if you go and buy a mag pump, for example, which is a very old pump, it's been around forever, it's got a five-year warranty. Uh, if you buy it at the fish store, it might cost you 150 bucks. If you buy it on Amazon, it might cost you 60 Since you're buying it at half the price, buy two and have one ready. That's, that's always been my advice. Uh, Buddy says, so why would you buy an Abyss pump when the pump you just bought is a fourth of the cost? All I can say is that just having one pump and no backup at all is a bad plan, which was the whole point of, you know, that conversation. And so I wanted to have something on the shelf. Now, if I don't have to use that pump for another seven years, <laughs> that's fine. I'll still have a backup pump the entire time. But if something bad were to happen, like the driver burns up from a lightning strike nearby, or... Um, the impeller seizes and, you know, it's under warranty. That means they'll fix it. But while they're fixing it, my tank is down. And if it takes, let's say, two weeks for total time to ship it, get it resolved and shipped back, that's two weeks I need a pump. So having this pump here, it's worth it. And, you know, could I have used something uh, less expensive? Possibly, you know. Let's decide, let me get something from MRC. I like that company and uh, I don't mind supporting them. Glenn says, can you share with us the importance of required hours of light photosynthesis each day? As I don't know how many hours would be best for the most growth and coloration required for keeping SPS. Thank you. Um, the photosynthetic light period, 
that plants use for chlorophyll, there's a, a max. They don't just keep producing chlorophyll for the entire duration of a day. So, you know, people say, well, I see the sun coming up at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whatever it is, whenever that happens. <laughs> I wouldn't know. And then it goes all the way day long. And, you know, and then it finally goes down 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night. And plants don't use it all day. They use it for about seven hours, maybe eight hours. And then their system shuts down. They've done what they had to accomplish and they're gonna rest. And they're no longer trying to do that particular photosynthesis. And with our corals, they have a symbiotic algae that also does the exact same thing. So what I have been saying for a long time and what I basically live by with my own tank is I have all my metal halides running for seven hours each, each day. And they, so these corals, LPS, softies, anemone, SPS, sand polyps, tongue coral, you know, another LPS, all those things are getting seven hours of light and then that light turns off. And I've, I've got a video on this channel where I talk about staggered lighting. So I have this one come on first and then this one comes on second about an hour and 15 minutes later. And then this one comes on uh, another hour and 15 minutes later. And then this one turns off at seven, this one turns off at 8.30 and that one turns off at 9.30. And that lets the light kind of move across my reef. And I like the look. So I um, have been doing it like that for a very long time. I mean, a very long time, probably 12 or 13 years. Yeah. So if you, now what's the downside? If you run too long, what can happen? If you have, you know, if the light period is just so long, like a 12 hour day or 13 hour day, what can happen is the corals get exhausted and you'll notice that they're getting pale. Uh, some might start to look bleached, some might die. Uh, it's just too much light too long. They just don't need that massive bath. So what I tell people is start your light later in the day. That way you can enjoy it all evening. If you're a morning person, like you worked all night and you're coming home to your tank and you wanna see it when you get home, you know, maybe you start your lights a couple hours before you head home and that way you've got four or five, six hours before, uh, and then by the time you're going to bed, those lights are getting close to cycling off again. But that would be what I recommend. Have I tried no pox with bio pellets? No, I haven't combined the two. Uh, Debbie says, how big is Spock? You know, she hates tape measures. <laughs> Literally, if I hold it up, she just takes off. But uh, seven, eight inches, something like that. Bill says, I love the two ATOs I got from you. Awesome, I'm glad you're happy. One of them got a little bit messed up with some solvent and I apologize for that. I hope the little bit of refund made a difference to you. Um, how's the clownfish? Good question. So the clownfish that I rescued from the refugium and put it back in the tank and I thought it's all great. It's not great. It's not bad, but it's not great. I wanted him to just be part of the collective and be happy. And they have kind of chased him into a corner again, but they're not being mean and he's living in some of the smaller anemones. And uh, then he goes and finds another spot to kind of hide and they just kind of look at him, but they haven't attacked. But I really wanted him just be reabsorbed with the, with the harem, you know, and just you know, everyone get along. But that hasn't been the case. Uh, Danilo asks, do you ship worldwide? Well, I've shipped to a lot of places. Um, I've shipped to Luxembourg, France, Germany, Italy. Uh, I had someone recently ask me about shipping to South Africa. Um, of course, Mexico and Canada happen a lot. Um, but yeah, I basically, anything that someone wants, if I can sell it in your country, which, I mean, there's certain products I can't. Like Ecotech products, I can't sell to someone in Europe because there are Ecotech producers there. Um, but if, if you want something I build, or if you want something like Benary for Live Rock Enhance or something like that, I can mail it to you. And it takes a little longer. It might take 10, 15 days to get to you, but I will look up and see how much the item costs, what does it weigh, and uh, I can get you an estimate on what shipping costs, and then you can decide if you want to do it. I just shipped a couple of orders this week to the UK. I assume that's England. Uh, Robert says, what is your favorite choice of pumps? Hands down, I love the Vortec pumps. I've been using them now since they came out. Uh, they came out in, um, they were shown like a prototype at Macna in 2006, which was here in Houston. And I saw it and I was like, that is amazing. And there was this massive line of people that was lined up, you know, to sign up to be a beta tester. 
And I saw, you know, like 50, 80, 100 people, whatever it was. I was like, well, there's no point asking. But I knew Tim, the owner of the company. And I, was, I just went over there and said, you know, I want to congratulate you. This product looks amazing. I think it's going to change, change the world, you know. And he said, did you sign up? I was like, no. What's the point? Look at all these people. He says, Mark, just sign up. So I signed up, and I actually got chosen to try out the prototype, which was awesome. And as soon as I can get my hands on the official ones, I got rid of my other pumps. I was using Maxi Jets. I was using Tunzi. I, was, I just hated all these pumps in my tank. I liked to have nothing in the tank but the livestock. I wanted invisible flow. And the Vortex is about as close as I can get to invisible flow, and it makes me really happy. I, I t tried out the gyre a little bit. It's okay. Wasn't in love with it. Didn't like how much of it blocked my view. Uh, I kept wanting to do a way where I could like put a piece of acrylic on top of the tank, all the way across, mount the gyre underneath it so just the gyre is under the water, like like maybe like right there in the middle, and then you know one right here possibly. And I thought that might work, and so it's less visible. But in the end, the Vortex do what I need. I've got the uh, two MP60s and MP40 on this tank. I've got an MP40 on the Enemy Cube. Um, oh, and the uh, frag tank right now doesn't have an MP. It has a uh, Nero 5, which uh, has done it. And that's made by AI, the sister company of Ecotech. Do you sell Apex systems on your website? I don't, but I do sell them. It's just not listed on my site. I was actually just thinking this week I need to put those on the website as well. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Skazion asked, uh, what halide bulbs do you use? I'm using Reef Bright Twin Arc bulbs. And the bulbs I have are 400 watts, and they have a 20K or 20 Kelvin uh, arc, and they have a 10,000 Kelvin arc. So right now, this part of my tank looks blue to you guys because it's in 20K mode. And the one here in the middle is actually in 10K, but I doubt you can make it out with this camera. I just don't think it's a... I think the camera can't pick it up. But, and then this one's not even on yet. So this is white light right now, and so all these corals are true to, true to life. I don't have the weird glows. All right. Um, Mod asks, would you ship a sump to Kuwait? It comes down to what it costs um, for you. <laughs> I can ship a sump anywhere. But what some people do is they say, build me a sump, and I need you to ship it to and it usually ends up being somewhere in Florida. And then it goes in a container with a lot of other things they got from BRS and some other companies, and all of that then goes to its final destination. Like in the case of the sump, I shipped to Germany. So you're only paying me you know, the, to cover what it costs to get from here to Florida, and then some other trans shipper is going to be involved for the rest of it. But yeah, it's something that can be done. It's definitely a possibility. Uh, Mojave says, I just dealt with two earthquakes. You must be in California. Made me revisit my backup plan. I have buckets and bins and battery backup air stones. Anything else you can recommend that I'm not thinking about for a power loss? Well, generator. The generator is the best tool in the world. Uh, they're noisy, but they uh, definitely do the job. And like the one I have will run for 12 hours on a full tank of gas, which is about five gallons of gas. And so I have a generator, and I, when I have a power outage, I get the tank running first with the generator, and then I will plug in other things later that day. Like after the metal halides are off for the night, I'll plug in the fridge. You know, of course, I already plugged in my internet to see what the heck's going on. Um, and I'll, I'll plug in my television, so I have something to do. But that is, uh, a generator is an awesome tool, and if it has to be run outside. There's an article I wrote years ago on reefaddicts.com that goes into how to use a generator. And if you haven't owned one before, there's a, a, a bunch of little things you should know. For example, most generators you buy are gonna have a, a pull cord like a lawnmower to start it. There's gonna be an on-off switch and there's gonna be a valve to open and close the gas line. So you're gonna have to switch it to on, open the valve so the gas can flow down in. The gas needs to be new, it can't be old gas from like a year ago because it won't burn. And then you gotta pull in that cord and get it started. And after X amount of time, you have to do maintenance. You got to change the oil on it. You got to maybe possibly change the spark plug. You want to keep it in tip top shape for when you need it. The best practices of a generator is to turn it on once a month for like five minutes or so, five or 10 minutes, just to keep everything operational and avoid it being seized up. 
You can put in additives into the fuel to make it uh, last longer. You can buy special fuel. It's very expensive. It's twenty dollars a gallon. But you put that stuff in. Uh, I found it at Home Depot, and that stuff will always start. <laughs> I don't know what's in it, but it's really good fuel. It's really expensive. And uh, the other choice, uh, so I just had someone show me their their truck. They got the smaller version of my Tundra. Uh, what is it? Not Tacoma. Can't think of it. He had a plug in the back of his truck, like a real live plug in. And I think he said it produced 400 watts. So he could run an extension cord to his aquarium if there was a power outage by just turning on his truck. So that was another option. It really comes down to where you can put it, um, you know, where you can run the cords. You know, can you have a cord going out through your front door, or your window, and not uh, risk your safety because now you can't lock the door because there's a cable in the way. Also, you can never run a generator indoors, just like you can't barbecue indoors. Uh, the fumes will get you. So you want to avoid that. Kelly says, do you use any other shipping methods besides FedEx? I actually do. Uh, FedEx is my main uh, choice, especially for <laughs> like shipping a box this size. I'm going to be using, you know, FedEx. But if it's something tiny, like I'm shipping something this size, I'll mail it in a box from the post office. And what happens is if you buy it from our website and the shipping seemed high, but it's a little tiny thing like Live Rock Enhance or... Uh, uh, a nano flipper scraper magnet or something that fits a little tiny box and it's light, I can ship it for about six bucks. And what I do is I just refund the difference. So uh, I'm hoping to get something added to my website in the very near future that will kind of do a thing in the background where it's like, if they bought this and nothing else, they can have the $6 shipping. Because when I tried to install that code myself, everyone was getting $6 shipping. <laughs> and I had to write people, I'm so sorry. I literally installed that last night and there's no way I can ship you that RODI system for $6. I can't do it, there's no way. So, ah, oh, Tacoma, huh, weird. I thought it was a different name. Robert asked, do you use any of the products to uh, replace beneficial bacteria over time? Well, I dose Prodibio twice a month and that's got bacteria in it. And uh, that's about it. You know, then the rest of it's just the reef, you know, me feeding. Oh uh, yeah, if you want to get Reef Enhance or Live Rock Enhance, I have both products, two different things. They look the same jar-wise, but different name. Um, I can ship that for six to you down there in San Antonio. It's not a problem at all. And you know, most things, I mean, I don't know how fast the post office is, but I would, you know, I'm shipping it first class. So I would think you'd have it in two, maybe three days at the most. If we paid FedEx, you'd have it the next day. So that is the difference. Uh, FedEx gets everything to Texas in one day. Uh, my new sump uh, that I just finished and built, someone asked me, what would that cost? And I already had someone contact me, said they wanted one just like it, and I told them $17.50. So there's a lot of work involved in that one, and uh, it's really nice, and I'm very happy with it. I mean, I just keep looking at it, and I keep grinning. can't stop. Sean asks, how much light would you give a mangrove? Uh, well, I'd use daylight, and the thing about a mangrove, it's a plant, and as it grows upward and the leaves are spread out, it keeps getting taller and taller. I mean, that's what they do. So you need to be able to lift the light higher and higher so you don't end up, you know, let's say your light is here and your plant is here and it's growing upward and upward. You don't want the light to cook the, the leaves at the top. I've never had a lot of luck with mangroves. You know, every once in a while I get, you know, I get a, a, a desire to do it temporarily, you know, and so I set it up and... It does okay. And you have to keep misting them. <clears throat> Every couple of days, you want to mist them with a spray bottle, just RO water. And it washes the salt and keeps the leaves clean, basically so the plant can breathe. And then it'll grow. And I've gotten one to grow about a foot tall and had, you know, about six or eight leaves. But Julian Sprung has been able to plant, you know, those saplings and then grow a bush. And then he sells this gorgeous mangrove bush at Macna for like $500. And, you know, people go home with a something he grew himself. That's really neat. But if you were wanting to do some kind of mangroves as part of a really cool uh, setup, I would be thinking about doing, like, some kind of a lagoon-type tank that has the mangroves growing in the back and your lights are high enough up that the plants are getting it. But you may end up having to add extra lights behind. And then how long is going to be just like light? You're going to want to run them for about eight hours a day of just good grow light on that plant. And my preference would be to not do it um, in a red light, because I hate the red. 
uh, I got a reminder from my moderator saying, post your website. <laughs> so that's where you can buy things from milosreef.com. And uh, if you're new to my channel, if you don't know me or you don't know a lot about me, my name is Mark E. Levinson, and that's where M-E-L-E-V comes from. It's just the initials of my name. And then the reef, me loves reef. All right. Cindy says, my magnesium is high at 1600 ppm. My calcium is around 510. My alkalinity is at 9.7. I'm only dosing alkalinity. How can I lower my magnesium without doing a water change? And when I do a water change, the numbers go up. I'm using red sea blue. It is possible that the new saltwater mix you're making has a really high magnesium content. And if that's the case, you don't have something to absorb it. You need to use salt water that has less magnesium in it than what's in your tank. So as you do each water change, you're bringing it down a percentage at a time. Uh, lots of Montipora will help soak it up. Uh, a high magnesium level like 1600, like you're reading, is hard on the snails. They have a hard time moving. Their feet atrophy and they get stuck and basically starve to death because they can't move. So you do want it to get lower, and really it is water change is the way to get rid of it, but you're gonna have to use salt water that has a lower magnesium level. <clears throat> uh, Mike says, how do you save the pods when you remove the macroalgae? One trick that you could use is to take the plant and shake it off in the salt water to kind of like just, it'll release all kinds of detritus, but you'll shake the bugs off. The other choice is just don't sweat it, remove the plants, you know, cause you're not gonna remove all of them, Typically we take out 25, 30% out of our refugium and leave the rest to grow and spread. And so if you took out a thousand little bugs and you, you know, I mean, getting them off the plants any other way or trying to shake them off in a bucket and then catch it in a net and pour it back in the tank, it seems like a, a lot of work. So I would just shake off the plant in the, the water and then I would pull out what I'm gonna pull out and call it a day. Uh, which size, Eric asks, which size Prodibia is the best for their 400 liter tank or 100 gallon tank? The regular standard size, those little vials, they're 50 gallons per vial. So you need two little vials of each of their products when you're dosing. And that would work fine. I use the bigger pro vials because they are uh, rated for 250 gallons. And H. Wolf says, I live in the panhandle. Can I pick up a sump? Yes, I love it when people pick up sumps. Number one, you get to see my tank. And number two, I don't have to pack it. I will help you get it in your car. Um, I will answer your questions. You know, I mean, you get the tour and um, size no longer becomes a factor. We can do whatever you need because we're not worried about constraints of making it fit a box that I have to ship. I had a customer reach out to me a week ago asking about a sump. And he said, I want it to be 60 inches long. And I was like, okay, I did the math. I was like, wow, okay, so FedEx allows up to 165 inches and we're at 164. So, and that's the girth of the box plus the length of the box. And the sump inside has to have four inches of padding on all six sides to get there intact. So yeah, if somebody can pick up a sump, I love that. I almost wish I had the, the time to just throw it in my truck and deliver. <laughs> and just visit the U.S., you know, and just like drive to New Mexico and drop off a sump and then drive to Arizona and drop off a sump and drive to New York, but that's never going to happen. <clears throat> Pontus says that he keeps tweaking his lights, trying to find that perfect spectrum and uh, having a hard time making a decision what will work without a PAR meter. The PAR meter would help you. I mean, that's an important tool. And if you have an Apex, they sell a PAR sensor that plugs in that will you can move around your tank. It actually comes with a rock and you can place it here, here, and there and kind of get some measurements. But uh, <clears throat> otherwise, it's all just guesswork. You know, what looks good to your eye, what you can tolerate. You know, because some people really like blue and then there's people like me that really like white. <laughs> so you want to find that happy spot. Um, 321 asked, can you have too much biomedia? Depends, what are we talking about? We're talking about bio bale, batting? Um, can you be more specific? And is there any treatment, Sharkman asks, for HLLE, which is whole and lateral line erosion on a tang? And is it contagious? Uh, HLLE is not contagious. It doesn't fish to fish, but uh, it, can be treated by solving whatever the problem is in the tank. Stray electricity is a big one. 
carbon dust in the tank is a big one. Um, and then stress, you know, some kind of stressor that's happening can also cause some of that damage. So I've got a tang behind me. It's been dealing with something ugly for a long time and I have to catch her and take her out and put her in some kind of medicated bath. I just haven't done it yet. But uh, I think it's a bacterial infection on her face. Let's see. I guess that's all the questions for now. Look at that. I'm all caught up. I'm trying to think what I have to share with you guys this week. I've pretty much covered it all. We should just stop right here. Go out on a good note. <laughs> Dave says, why do we have to use baked baking soda for pH? Well, <clears throat> I have an article on my website that is called Don't Chase pH. And if you are literally trying to keep a certain pH number in your tank without keeping track of alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium, you might be doing your tank a disservice. Odds are you keep putting in the baked baking soda, which is soda ash. And as you keep putting that in, you're raising the alkalinity higher and higher and higher in your tank because you're not measuring that one. Our pH, our goal number that we like is, is 8.1 to 8.3. But there's a lot of healthy tanks out there that are 7.7 .7 to 7.9. And uh, so I wouldn't really sweat the, uh, the risk that your pH isn't at a magic 8.3. I mean, I would look at your livestock and how's the livestock doing? And if it's healthy, then why are we even worrying about it? So be sure you read that article because that's really important. Ah, Glenn, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. And I missed another one from Danny. Thank you so much for that super chat. And was there another one that slid past my eyeball? You guys have been a chatty bunch today. I don't see any more. Uh, Kelly asks, what again are you feeding your copper band? Uh, my copper band loves mysis now. So I've been using PE mysis because PE mysis has got an oil in it and it's a chunkier meat and I watched my butterfly just go around and it loves it. And I was using blood worms, but that didn't work. <clears throat> so I, I mean, it, it worked, but then I know she ignored them. And I was like, well, that's kind of pointless. I was putting them in every single night for her and she was going after all the mysis. <laughs> so that's okay. And there's no aptasia in my tank, so that part's good. I have a few little Mahanos I need to deal with here in my near future. Uh, Steve Smith says, I found out the hard way I have stray voltage in my tank. When you say the hard way, does that mean when you touch the water, it shocked you? Um, and uh, would that have caused some coral death? Some stray electricity can affect your corals, but it depends how much. I had a pretty significant amount of power in my tank one time. I think it measured somewhere around uh, <clears throat> 45 or 48 volts. <laughs> it was a lot. And I you know, removed the ground probe from the tank and I started measuring everything and i discovered i had a power head that was super old that still worked i was using in the refugium just to make flow and that power head was leaking tons of power into the water and i removed that and solved most of the problem so uh yeah can it but my corals weren't in distress it was more like i didn't like getting shocked <laughs> uh, aaron asks i've been running bio pellets for two months and it hasn't lowered my nitrates well bio pellets need to run in a reactor and the first month, they're not going to do anything because they're getting, they're basically uh, kicking in. They take four weeks to kick in. And then once they're going, you're going to be dosing Microbacter 7 with it every week. And that should help. Uh, you may not have enough bio pellets for your tank. You know, like there's, there's a certain amount you should use per gallon. And perhaps you're not using enough. But you have to be careful with bio pellets. I mean, I have a whole video about this topic. And if you use too much, you might end up with some cyano problems. And you definitely have to catch the effluent in front of your skimmer. And, uh, but no, it should, it should do the job. I mean, a lot of people use bipellets and they're, they're great. Moshi asks, when are you going to talk, do a talk about calcium reactors? I'm setting one up this week. Probably after you're done. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. Um,
I'm doing good with getting things caught up on my end, other than the slight setback with my thumb this week, but uh, that was the whole point. Now, I do know we're doing a live stream next week, um, but the one after that will not happen because I will be in San Diego for Comic-Con. So I'll just give you guys a heads up. Debbie asks, what causes RTN? I lost three corals overnight in a frag tank. And all the parameters are good. Well, it's hard to just come up with an instant answer. RTN, rapid tissue necrosis, happens with corals when something is outside of their comfort range. It could be temperature, it could be alkalinity, uh, it could be salinity. Uh, these are some of the big three that typically cause problems. And then you'll just watch a coral go up in smoke. Sometimes it's just chemical warfare between corals. Uh, or because you fragged it and you handled it and you glued it and you planted it, you know, it just gave up. Could be that. <clears throat> Could be just bad luck with those few. You know, it, there's so many different factors to keep in mind. It's kind of hard to predict that one. When I do see an RTN event happening in my tank or in my frag system, I usually don't touch it. I just leave it alone and see how far it goes. And of course, check everything. Make sure there's no weird stuff going on that could be contributing to the problem. But for example, you know, bird's nest, very easy coral to grow, grows super fast, dies super fast. And when bird's nest starts to RTN, I just ignore it. I don't touch it because going in there and cutting and saving and trying to rescue all these branches ends up losing everything. Instead, I leave it alone. Most of it dies, some of it lives. I cut off what lives, I replant that, and I throw away the dead skeleton and start again. And, you know, in a few months, it's big again. So that's a nice one. <clears throat> um, yes, I can do that. Give me a second here. I think we have enough wire to get that request answered. Change this down a little bit lower. Be right back, guys. See if this thing reaches. believe I got that in the frame. Let's see what we got here. So there is my power panel. It's a little blown out. Not much I can do about that, I don't think. The uh, power panel is made out of acrylic. <clears throat> I made it a couple years ago. Did a video about it as well, so it goes into all the detail. And I mounted all my Apex and Ecotech gear on there. <clears throat> And uh, what you're looking at in the bottom left corner is the white thing is a huge battery that keeps the vortex or the vector running if there's a power outage. You see some power bricks there that support the uh, refugium light and the vectra pump and then one to charge the battery. On the top right is the Apex EB8 or the Energy Bar 8 with eight outlets. Underneath that is a PM1 module that has pH and temperature so I can measure that tank with the same apex that the rest of my system uses. So you can run multiple PM1s off of a system and track multiple tanks. <clears throat> All right. Steve says, how do you deal with Mahanos and Aptasia? Well, uh, I did a video about scraping Mahanos off the rock one by one, which is my favorite method because you just get it done and you're moved on. You can do other things like try to burn them with lasers. You can uh, cover them in Aptasia X. You can uh, squirt them full of boiling water or lemon juice or muriatic acid. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. But if I can just scrape it off, pop it off the rock and get rid of it, <clears throat> it's, it's done. You know, and I prefer that because I find that if you just keep constantly uh, messing with it, <clears throat> You're, it just seems to never end, unless you really stand off of it. Like, you're putting Aptasia X on Aptasia, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it every single day until they're gone, you'll probably win that battle. 
But if you do it and then expect miracles, you know, and then three weeks from now you see one again, you're like, oh, and then you see three or four and you're like, ah, oh. and then finally you start doing it again and you kind of hit them down, but you're not like eradicating them. They'll just keep coming back. It's, it's one of those things that we have to just like get our arm wet over and over and over until there's no trace of it. And once you finally got rid of it, you should be, you should be good to go. Uh, Manuel says, my acans are shriveling up slightly. They were more plump when I bought them and I've tested my parameters. Uh, acans are a little moody. They're an LPS coral. And you know, I've got some that look super fluffed up and other times they look really retracted. There's a chance that you have something that is nibbling on your coral, not to hurt it, but they might find something edible on there. And if they nip at it, the coral will retract for protective reasons. And then later on re-fluff up. So I'll keep an eye on those acans and just give them some time. And if they're not getting hit with a ton of flow, they should be okay. I would check multiple times a day and night and just look at it from all the different time periods because it might be more fluffy in the lighting period or it might be more fluffy during the dark period when you've got a flashlight. You know, they could be feeding all night, for example. So just take, take a look and double check. Uh, Ponta says, how long have you been running this reef tank? This tank has been going for five and a half years. Uh, there's every year I do an anniversary video on the channel so you can actually see the change over time and uh, The next anniversary will be November 10th. That'll be six years six years that the silicone is oh. oh Knock on wood doesn't help silicone. Let's go and it let's go drives me nuts uh, Amanda says what are the dimensions of your tank? This tank is 84 inches long, 36 inches front to back, and 30 inches tall. And it's sitting on a steel stand that is 42 inches tall, so I can stand in front of it instead of having to bend down to look inside the tank, because I don't like doing that. I like to look at a tank at eye level. It's just my preference. Uh, Sean says he needs to come visit. Well, then do it. Let me know when you're going to be by. And uh, let me know what you need. <laughs> it's always good to pick up an order while you're here. Um, John says, I would not run my refugium lights while the main tank is on. I turn mine on at night. And that helps keep the pH stable. It's true. So having your macroalgae growing at night when the main lights are, out, are off would help in kind of keeping that pH from dropping too low during the late night hours. And uh, it comes down to, it's called a reverse light cycle. And it's a good method. I personally am not doing that because I really enjoy darkness at night. You know, I'm up late into the night and uh, I just enjoy a nice dark room, especially if I've got the TV on and I just don't need my refugium blinding me. <laughs> and I, I say blinding, but I mean, it's pretty significant. I, I did talk to Reef Bright about getting a new light. So that is, uh, I haven't got my quote yet, but <clears throat> the process has started. I'm looking at getting a XHO that's only got the white lighting that I like, and uh, it'll be 40 inches long, which is a, a custom size, but it'll fit in really nice inside my sump, right at the rim where it can't get wet, but it'll provide plenty of light and not uh, create a reflection off the rim of the sump because the front of my sump has that acrylic rim that uh, I can grab that other camera. Give me a second here, I'll go fetch it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> And I kind of have to hold it at eye level so this does what I think it's what it should do. Let's see. So if you look, see how the acrylic rim reflects the lights and blinds you? I don't like that. So I would like the light to be further back and down inside so that that blindness goes away. So that is a plan of mine. All right. What else? John says, how many gallons is that tank? This is a 400 gallon reef. And it was custom made for me uh, from Marineland. Manuel says, how crucial is a fixed light schedule? Sadly, my lights have a pretty bad user interface and I'm left manually changing the lights to night mode manually at random times after dark. <laughs> yeah, um, that would be a pain, especially if you wanna go on vacation, you wanna travel. It would be nice if you could find a way to schedule it and you know map it out. The, there's so many brands of lights on the market at this point. I'm surprised you haven't found a light fixture that'll just kind of work better with your schedule because to be able to program them is really 
a beauty of LED technology these days. And even my XHOs, I actually have something on there. It's an add-on that I installed a few months ago. It's not super interesting, so I haven't done any review about it. I just installed it and used it. And it lets me open up an app on my phone, and I can tell it I want 1% blue lighting <clears throat> and at like 10 a.m., just a little bit of blue. And then, you know, at 11 o'clock, it could be at 13%. And then, you know, at 11.30, it hits it at like 85%. And then it's, you know, lots of blue all day long, you know, going in conjunction with the metal halides. And then taper it all the way off into moon mode. And you can set in a ton of set points if you wanted to with that light because it's some kind of a Bluetooth uh, receiver, I guess. In the It's, it's quite the harness. <laughs> it was a lot to install to replace the original simple power brick that I had. But that one harness does both lights now, where the other one I had to have two separate lights plugged in. So now they're all in one power cord, which is kind of nice. Uh, Bill says, have you ever considered going all LED? Trying never to agree to that. <laughs> I really like the metal halides. I always have. And I know a lot of people that have gone LEDs and then said they were reverting back to metal halides. And so I feel like I skipped that whole yo-yo effect. But that doesn't mean that they're, they're problematic because there's a lot of beautiful reefs out there and I'm like, wow. But you could say the same thing about T5s. There are some gorgeous reef tanks out of Poland. All they have is T5 bulbs and their tanks are phenomenal. And you would say, well, how come you've never done T5s? <laughs> so it's the same principle. You know, it, it just, you have to find something that you like and will work for you. I've got a friend who's got radions over his tank. He's had them for years. And he said, you know, I'm not getting the growth I want. And I said, when did you buy those? And he said, oh, I think they're like eight years old. And I was thinking, well, there you go. I mean, most LED fixtures, they're rated for five years of use, and then you have to replace it. And in his case, he's been running it three more years since then. And odds are the light pucks are just done. They're just not putting out the light they used to put out. Ironworks says, how am I doing? <laughs> well, I'm here. That's, that's, is that a good enough answer? Last uh, Friday night, I did something fun on Facebook. I'd been drinking wine, and I started a thread called Ask Me Anything. And for about 50 minutes, I was just like rapid fire responding to any question that came up. It was hilarious. And I might do that again someday, but that was a lot of fun. And I was doing really well that night. Debbie says, what's your recommendation on using a CO2 scrubber for pH? <clears throat> um... A CO2 scrubber is a reactor with media inside it that will help absorb the CO2 out of the air before the air is sucked into your protein skimmer to make the skimmer more efficient. And that in turn will help raise the pH of your tank too because you're removing CO2 from the system. You're gonna have to stay on top of the media. You're gonna have to uh, either replace it or rejuvenate it somehow. I feel like, you know, I, I've never actually done it, but I believe you can bake the media and that way it's like recharged to use it again and again. And I think it's one color and then as it gets used up, it turns purple, sort of like DI resin changes colors. So, um, but that's about as much information as I have about that one because I don't have any personal experience. I've just never, I've never really worried about pH. And when I was setting up my new Apex, we calibrate all my probes and now my pH is measuring lower on my tank and I still don't care. <laughs> it's like, I don't need that certain number. I care about alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, salinity. And I've been trying to get salinity up. And as of last night, I did all my measurements. And uh, today, my alkalinity was 9, which has been rock solid. Calcium's 450. Phosphate was 0.25. Um, nitrate was 10. Yay. So I reduced my NOPOX dose in half. Uh, salinity is 1.025. Magnesium was 1,400. And pH measured at 7.9 at that time. And my tank was 80.2 when I did those measurements last night. <clears throat> Kevin says, I'm using a con. Well, a peristaltic dosing pump from a calcium reactor set to three milliliters per minute. Wow, that's really slow. And I had a DKH of 12, but the pH was close to where I wanted it to just keep the air stone off. Is the DKH on the high side, the 12? No. Oh, okay, so...
I don't really understand how you're doing it. Three milliliters per minute, that is nothing. You must have a really small tank and you're trying to really control, you know, that you don't have an overdose. But the alkalinity coming out of a calcium reactor should measure between 19 and 35. And then that drip rate is what will go into your tank. And in my case, I like a steady stream rather than a drip. And three milliliters a minute is going to be the slowest drip ever. And uh, I would say you're looking at Typically people want, you know, the general rule in the old days was one drip per second. Like I said, mine's a stream. I have mine running at 71 milliliters a minute. So what is that, 50 times faster than yours? <laughs> I don't know, but 12 seems low because you want your tank to be at a certain level, but the effluent should be higher to keep up with the tank's demands. Now, if your tank is running at 12, for right now, you don't need to run the calcium reactor and kind of let it come down a little bit more. Somewhere between eight and 11 is our goal. Like I said, on mine, I've been, I locked mine in at nine and I'm very happy with that number. Uh, Manuel says, what's the attachment for your lights that you mentioned? The attachment for the XHO that I want to put for the refugium? Um, he's got these little pieces that fit on the end that will just screw in with tiny screws and they have little holes. And I'm probably gonna do some kind of a yo-yo system with some fishing line and mount it underneath the stand. And that way I can lift the light up to reach in there and do what I gotta do and then pull it back down into position where I like it. Uh, this light that I have right now, I've had for nine years and nine and a half years. And it's uh, got these steel cables, the, you know, the stainless steel wire with hooks. And I have these metal tracks with multiple holes and, I, and there's a pulley. And so I will lift the light up and move the hook to the furthest point over and that brings the light and keeps it way up high so I can work. And then when I'm done, I put it into the lowest hole and on the other side, I do the lowest hole. And then I've got my light back where it belongs. But uh, the new system, I want to do something a little differently because I think the light will be much lighter. It won't need all that gear. And I won't have to worry about rust. I really love using fishing line to hang lights. <laughs> I mean, I don't just get like regular fishing line. I get like 50 pound test, which is probably, I don't know, I'm not a fisherman, but I'm assuming it's for larger catches. And I just know it can handle a lot of strength and it's holding a five pound light, it won't be a problem and I can just tie it off. And if I need to change, I can just cut those string and put a new string, but it's you know really durable stuff. Okay, so you're using four milliliters with a Camor and it's for a 29 gallon tank. Well, I mean, you know, you're running a calcium reactor on a 29 gallon tank. That's, that's tricky in itself. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, your effluent, you need to measure the effluent and see what the strength is of the alkalinity coming out of it. And that's, that's the first step. That helps you also decide what you're gonna do with the rest of the tank. Um, Alan says, I'm currently using Fiji mud, but I'm changing to the Triton style sump. Should I reuse the mud or buy new mud or go without the mud? Thanks in advance. I've seen these muds. They've been around for a long time. The first one that came out was in the early 2000s and it was called Miracle Mud. And it was guaranteed to provide all these really cool nutrients for your tank, or not nutrients, uh, elements and uh, trace metals and so forth. And it was mud, I mean, wow. And you got the small little carton, kind of like a small milk box, you know, medium-sized milk box that had, I don't know, a pound, two pounds inside there, I don't know. And it was $80. And you had to have a tray and you'd pour the mud in the tray and you'd lower the tray into your sump and then you put a second tray and a third tray. And then after a certain amount of time, which I think was nine months, maybe it was sooner, maybe it was six months, you're supposed to take the first tray out, replace that mud, and then you know, the next tray gets changed you know, after X amount of months and you just kind of rotate through them. And uh, I found, I mean, the name Miracle Mud already kind of, kind of set off a, a warning sign in my head, you know, just like, what? And I saw a lot of reef tanks and I never saw a reef tank with Miracle Mud that made me happy. It just didn't happen. Now, it's been, you know, 16, 17, 18 years. I've seen a lot of reef tanks and I've occasionally come across a tank that had Miracle Mud or Fiji Mud or these other brands. And, uh, you know, they, they were really pretty, but it didn't get me to the point where I said, I need that too. You know, if, if it was miraculous, you know, if it really was as fantastic as, as purported to be, I think all of us would just be buying it just like we buy buckets of salt water and I mean, you know, buckets of salt and buying RODI systems and buying cleaning magnets. You know, these are things we just always get no matter what. 
and we would say, yes, you cannot run a tank without it. <laughs> I think we would do that. But that's not the case with this one. I think it's a, uh, I do know the original Miracle Mud came out of Utah, which is really far away from any ocean. And uh, I don't know, it just didn't quite sit right with me, so I didn't do it. I'm not trying to disparage it, I'm just saying it didn't convince me, and so I didn't go for it. Oh, the, uh, the light rack that's above the tank. Uh, there's a whole video about it. And um, it's on a rolling track. And uh, I think you should just check out the video. Matter of fact, you can watch the XHO video and it'll show the install and everything and goes into a lot of details. The Bluetooth technology stuff was added later. It's just a harness with a lot of bricks and I just threw it on the top. Ah, well, there you go. So Mike Paletta and Sanjay are both running uh, tanks with Miracle Mud. I didn't know that. I've never seen them mentioned it in any of their stuff and I've been to multiples of their talks. So that's good. And yeah, Sanjay's got a beautiful reef. Okay, well, good. Uh, Linton says, I have a film on the surface of my sump. Should I add a pump or skim it out? Actually, one of the neat tricks we can do with salt water, when you have a skin on the top of your aquarium, on top of a barrel of salt water, inside the surface area of your sump, you can take paper, like, you know, the kind of paper you put in a printer, you know, for like an inkjet. You can just lay the paper on the surface of that skin and peel it right off and it cleans your water. It's really neat. And it just, it attracts to it. You can try it with a paper towel, but paper towels tend to fall apart. Printer paper, I always have so much because I have printers here for work. And I just throw a sheet on there and then I'll kind of scooch the stuff to kind of push the film into the corner. And I throw another sheet on there and I just blot the surface until it's gone. So it's just, I might use four or five sheets and now my, my sump is clean again, if that was a thing. And I've had stuff like that happen in the past. Pickle Boy says, do you sell power heads on your site? Uh, Maxi jets are on the website and Vortec pumps are on the website. Yes. And here is that link. You just go to shop and then go to equipment and you can see what I sell. Pontus says, this is my third and last question. Are you going to visit Sweden anytime soon? It's not uh, scheduled. <laughs> Uh, not at this time. I um, I don't know. I haven't been to Europe in a few years. Last I tend to go to Switzerland because I have family there, and so I you know once I'm there, I'm near all the other countries. It's really easy to go visit some more. But I don't know. It's it's not a a plan right now. My next trip is San Diego Comic Con, and uh, that will be a lot of fun. And then after that, I'm hoping to sell some acrylic boxes, trophy cases to put over. Uh, characters, you know, and uh, heroes. And um, then I think Macna in Florida, Orlando is going to be the next one. So those are my upcoming trips there. I've also got a trip at some point to uh, I can't think of the state. Might be Miss Minnesota, possibly. So there's a few coming up. D asked, do you have a chiller? No, I do not. I haven't had a chiller on any of my tanks ever. <laughs> Are you wearing a costume for Comic-Con? Uh, not this year. Uh, I've ended up, over the years, I've gone as a few different uh, simple characters because it's a, uh, I'm, I'm all about personal comfort. And I've watched guys that dress up like Halo with a helmet and everything, carry the giant gun all day. And they look amazing until they pull that helmet off and they're just dying inside. They're sweating so hard. And it's like, yeah, I don't want to dress up as anything like that where I'm miserable. Plus, I mean, when you dress up like a really good character where people want to stop you and take your picture, you end up doing that stop, take a picture all day long, every day, and you don't get to see the con at all. So I've gone as Captain Kirk a few times. And that was easy because it was black slacks, the, the Starfleet uniform shirt, a phaser, a tribble, you know, just something easy and casual. And then you can go find yourself an Orion slave girl, or you can find yourself a Gorn, or you can find, uh, you know, there's, there's always Star Trek people there. So it's easy to, find them for, to take group pictures and stuff like that. So it's fun. Um, but uh, this year, I, my plan is just to go. Just go, have business cards in my pocket, promote uh, acrylic sales, and who knows, maybe pick up some clients. That would be great. 
Uh, Todd says, I missed seeing you at Rap New York. Do you not attend the rap shows? I have never been to the rap show in New York. That's the only one I haven't gone to. And at the time when that was happening, I was installing my new sump, I believe, or I was building the sump. Maybe that's what it was because I was just like, I need to stay home. I've been traveling so much this year. I got to stay home, get this project done, get it installed. The guy picked up the old sump that you saw pictured in the video that we removed. The next day he was, he was here. Um, and I'd say within another day, he sent me pictures of it installed under his tank and he was already, you know, plumbing it in. <laughs> so wasted time getting it installed. Uh, UC Doolittle says, what plants do you recommend for refugium and how have you kept your calerpa from going sexual and melting? The type of calerpa that I have is called feather calerpa. Uh, there's pictures on my critter ID section of my website that shows the different macroalgaes and feather calerpa doesn't go sexual. So you don't have to worry about that. There are certain algaes that do, such as uh, grape calerpa does that. I don't think razor calerpa can. Uh, there's like nine different types of calerpa, but feather calerpa is bulletproof. I've never had a problem with it. I don't have to run lights 24 hours a day. When I was running the old stuff, which I think is called calerpa numularia, that one would. I'd watch it actually bleed the green out of its stems and this, the whole plant would turn clear and then in a day it would just dissolve. And yeah, it went sexual and died. So that one I had to keep the light on 24 hours a day just so it wouldn't do that, which was a workaround. It wasn't a great solution, but I was tired of buying macroalgae from the fish store over and over when I was just growing a weed. It's like, I can't believe I have to keep buying this stuff. So I uh, ended up switching. Now, Ketomorpha is a really good one that a lot of people like. It grows really fast. It looks like a giant ball of steel wool that's green, but I've never had a lot of luck growing it. I don't know why. I can grow feather calerpa all day long. I put in Ketomorpha and it kind of like hangs in there for a while. Then one day I just say, hey, it's gone. It, it just didn't make it. So I do believe that one needs more flow and that uh, with my tank, I don't have as much flow in the refugium as that particular plant needs. In the old days, people were talking about running Ketomorpha which is spelled like cheetah morpha. <laughs> and uh, they would say that you had to have flow come across the top to make the ball just tumble or spin. And that's just a lot of work. So I, I just didn't sweat that stuff. Feather Calerpa works great. Um, Joey asks, do you know of any place that locally that sells Bergia nudibranchs? No, I don't. Uh, but I did read someone recently posting that they were breeding them. Somewhere on Facebook. You have to go to Facebook world and find it. Uh, I don't know. But uh, odds are it's somebody out of Florida, typically. And the best way to find someone breeding them is to find somebody that's asking for Aptasia because <laughs> they need to keep those things fed to make more. Debbie, I think I got an invite to that Aquafest in 2020 from one of your members. And uh, I haven't committed to it yet, but it's, it's definitely a possibility. Alrighty. Do you have a coral wish list or a wish list coral item? You know, I really don't. Um, oh, well, yeah, there's a coral I want. I've been wanting for a long time. I never remember its name. So I stuck it on my website so I could look it up. See if I can find it for you guys really quick. It's an SPS coral. And my, f my friend Brad, whose tank I filmed and you're gonna be seeing very soon, he had a huge colony of this stuff and it was gorgeous. And its name is, hey, that doesn't belong there. I gotta move that. <laughs> oh, Pearlberry Acropora. Uh, it's been around for a long time and uh, it's super pretty. So, uh, well, looks like blue to me. <laughs> it looks better on the phone. Um, but Pearlberry Acropora is one I've always wanted. I love it. And uh, it would be really cool to get my hands on some of that. The, the coloration and the way it grows is really pretty. And like I said, Brad had it for a long time. He took pictures all the time. So I enjoyed it uh, through his pictures. But then something happened in his tank and he lost some corals, including that one. 
And so now he's also looking for some as well. I believe it's an ORA coral, which means it probably does still exist. It's just a matter of getting your hands on one. Uh, Octopus Dude says, what happened, or how's the Walt Disney doing? It's not doing great. I was looking at it the other day. It's mostly just green. It just, it lost its color. I had it in a spot where it was getting some shade and I, I went to have that a lot of light. So I moved it proactively and, you know, it didn't like being moved and then it's turned pretty much green. So maybe it's no pox is causing it. Maybe it's, uh, it doesn't like its new location. Maybe the flow is different. It's alive, but it's not pretty. Um, have you ever used Flux RX? No, I've never needed to use fluconazole. Uh, that is a product that's used to get rid of bryopsis. Um, and it is a method that can let you um, treat the tank and keep it running. You just turn off the skimmer and use that medicine, um, which is an antifungal medicine. You use that in your system for three weeks straight, and that should make the algae die off. I haven't used that one, but I carry it because I carry blue life products and people ask for it. So I didn't even know they had it. And I was like, hey, how come I don't sell this? And so they sent me some to put in my shop. So I do have that. Um, Joey asks, do you have any experience making coral snow out of calcium carbonate? Nope, I've never done that. I've, I know there was a product from, uh, I think it was Two Little Fishies called Marine Snow, and I never used it. Uh, Joey, I want to see this Garcia Acropora. I want to see what it looks like. <laughs> that one doesn't ring a bell with me. Yeah, so Aurora does have the Pearlberry, so I could, me and Brad should probably just order one, you know, through our fish stores. My uh, super high dollar uh, King's Ransom LPS is doing well. And we got some white light, so maybe you guys can see this. Let me adjust this tripod really quick. I mean, it's not a gorgeous Haken in this lighting, but we'll see what happens here. Let's see. So that's it right there in the foreground. It's probably about five or six polyps now, and I see it eating at night, and it's super gorgeous under blue light. But under white light, it's very, you know, it's got green centers. It's got an orange mouth. It's got some red and some orange on the uh, main tissue. There's some white striations. It's pretty. I like it. Focus. Is it going to focus? Huh. thought it would. What a bummer. you got to move away from it to see it. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, that was the most expensive acro or coral I bought this year. And... Uh, yeah, see, the close, the further I get, the harder it is to see. But it's a nice little coral. Hey, there's Spock. Um, Emmanuel says, do you have any feather dusters in your tank? You know, the big ones, the Hawaiian feather dusters. I haven't kept any feather dusters in forever. I remember when I got some, when I first got in the hobby in 1998, I just thought they were so pretty. And uh, I was really happy to get it and then I bought a long nose butterfly because I asked the fish store I said here is everything I have and he says yeah you're fine you can get this fish and then I came home and it was eating my feather duster and it was eating my sponges and it was, eat it was eating everything I cared about and I was really mad at the guy so <laughs> I basically uh just said you know no more I, I returned it and he was really mad he goes we don't take fish back like yeah you will you did not tell me this was going to eat all the things I care about I'm a, I love invertebrates and you're not going to sit here and just kill off my stuff and then act like it's all okay because that guy was the grumpiest fish store owner I'd ever met in my life. I've met some bad ones and he was the worst. So yeah, I returned it, got my money back and uh, ended up getting a totally different fish later on. So I shall throw this on the screen. It is a reminder that we have a really great group on Facebook where we chat and communicate, share pictures, ask questions. It's a great group where everyone gets along. We uh, don't allow people to attack each other or belittle them. And uh, that's why the group is so peaceful, even with 5,000 members. So definitely recommend you join. Uh, I'm the one that approves all the names that come in. I, I actually read the questions, the answers you give to the questions. And uh, 
it, it's been really good. So if you are looking for an area where you can ask, what is this without being put down, we're a great group for you. So, and it's, like I said, it gives me a chance to see your favorite corals or, or how your tank is doing or what your filtration looks like. Cause I'm always showing you what I have, but uh, I don't always get to see what you have. And there's lots of you guys. So having that group has allowed me to actually get a peek into your lives and your tanks and your homes and see your setup, which is awesome. So you're definitely invited to join that group. Also always recommend that you also follow this link that is the Mila's Reef page on Facebook when people say I want to send you a friend request I'm like rather than following Mark Levinson just go ahead and follow the Mila's Reef page because that's where I share all the aquarium related stuff my personal page is personal it's family and friends and I'm just I just don't add people so there's no point in getting upset just realize I'm available in Mila's Reef I'm available in Club Mila's Reef and uh, I know here on YouTube and I'm on I'm an email away, people text me. I mean, you know, my phone, I have to keep plugging it in because, you know, it gets hit from every direction. Uh, the sand bed is about four inches deep and uh, it's been in there for five and a half years. And I just let the cleanup crew do their thing. Rosano says, what is the safest way to increase salinity? My refractometer drifted over time. I thought my 120 gallon was at 1.026, but discovered it's 1.021 and I need to correct it. Well, the simplest thing you can do is turn off your auto top off. So quit adding fresh water and start topping off with salt water. And you can either pour in the salt water or you can move your top off device into the barrel or bucket of salt water and let that add it as it evaporates. And that will help. One of the reasons your salinity may have swung quite a bit besides the, the faulty measurement is if your protein skimmer is pulling out a lot of skimmate and it's really watery, as it's pulling out salt water, your top off is adding fresh water and so your salinity will drop. And this happens to a lot of people with automatic water change systems too. So if you're doing automatic water changes where you have a couple of dose pumps doing the job and you never lift a bucket anymore and you're proud of it, that's fine, but check your salinity every single week. Super important. And like he was mentioning before, you know, he, his calibration got out of range. So you want to also verify the calibration on your measuring device to make sure it's giving you an accurate number so that your reef will not take a hit. Have you tried the new Varios pumps by Reef Octopus? No, I have not. I don't think I even have one here. Sometimes I get pumps sent to me to try out and I don't think that's on my pile. Um, I just uh, showed a pump that I bought. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Um, Pickle Boy asks, what would be a good power head to buy off the website for a 29 gallon fish tank? I would say the MaxiJet 1200. The, uh, it's gonna say MJ 1200 and it's uh, made by Cobalt. And uh, I, I have lots of those in my stuff everywhere. Whenever I need a pump, I grab a MaxiJet. <laughs> They're just great little utility pumps. They move about 300 gallons an hour. They can clip on the tank. Uh, you can secure them with the horrible suction cups. I'm not a fan of that because a suction cup is not forever. It'll hold for a while until it doesn't. And then you're, you're up a creek. So I would say that you wanna just go ahead and use like the clip that grabs on the rim of the tank and connect it where it's locked in tight. Or they have something called Sure Grip, which is a special magnet uh, holder that will fit a lot of different power heads, including the MaxiJet. And you buy that thing separately and you magnetize it and put that pump exactly where you want it. And that way it can never fall down and blow all your substrate and get all the crap going everywhere because when a power head falls down the tank or points straight down, it just causes all kinds of chaos. So, well guys, we've been at this almost two hours. I think we should stop. I appreciate you guys all tuning in. Uh, we still have 176 eyeballs on us right now. That's pretty impressive. And uh, yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. Dingo said the same thing, maxi jets. I have tons of them, yeah, because they just last forever. And today is water test Saturday, so be sure you test your water parameters. I, you know, I enter all my parameters in Reef Trace, and I was talking with a developer of Reef Trace again uh, yesterday, and they are working on some new updates for that app to do even more than what it's done before. And some really cool features are gonna be coming, you know, later on this year. You know, these things take time to develop. I was like, I'd really like to see this. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's gonna take some time. So that stuff's coming. 
Uh, I still would like to do some kind of a, a video showing how to use Reef Trace. I think some kind of a tutorial would kind of help to kind of let you see all the features built into that app. It's available for Android and for iOS. And uh, it all started off as just a way to measure your water. And it would allow, it had the instructions in there. It had videos to show you how to use the test kits. It has the actual color charts on your screen to compare against. And uh, it would track all your data. And I mean, my data goes back two, two and a half years now. And it's all cloud-based, so it saves your data no matter what. And, uh, but then I find that for me, the more practical use of that app is the LFS locator. Because I can just open the app wherever I am and hit LFS list, and it'll put a little blue marker in the middle of my map, and that's me. And then anything within 45 miles of me, it'll show up on the map. These are actual fish stores that exist that have been verified. They've been called and made sure they're open for business. And if you are aware of a store that's not in your area and you're an app user, and you're saying, how come, how come they don't have new fish wave, then you can actually report that. And you can let us know this store exists so we can add it. So be sure you do that. The, uh, once you've got all your water parameters tested, you want to see what you need to adjust. Do not overreact if you see a number you don't like. Uh, we talked about a few things today, whether it's alkalinity or salinity or phosphate. You know, minor adjustments are usually best for your reef tank rather than quick, harsh changes. So um, other than phosphate, I always drop phosphate like a rock, <laughs> but I'm nuts. Uh, I just, I've never had a bad thing happen, so I, I don't worry about it. And for me to just dump phosphate or X in here after having the big auto feeder disaster happen, wouldn't, I wouldn't even blink at that. I, was, I would just do it. But because I'm dosing no pox, I'm trying not to add another chemical to the tank right now. So I'm just going to let it go and see what happens. But please do take good care of your tank. You know, <laughs> take good cares. Take good care of your tanks and, uh, you know, keep your livestock healthy and happy. Uh, I know it's a hobby, but I, I'm feeling like we need to treat it more like a job in the regards of we need to stay on top of it and keep it super clean and keep it super healthy because that way it'll thrive. And we all want a beautiful reef tank we can show off. So guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend and I will see you guys next Saturday.